All right, hi everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the gap between model based and model free methods on LQR. And this is joint work with my PhD advisor, Ben Recht. All right, so the premise of this, uh, this work is kind of uh, observation of the increasing popularity of model free methods we see in the empirical literature. So, various examples of this include one of OpenAI's projects. Uh, a lot of people have been studying these Mojoku uh, OpenAI tasks, or the OpenAI gym tasks. Also, we've seen this kind of in deep Q learning and um, a nice project from Google Brain. So we've got a lot of like, really cool empirical results using model-free methods. And I want to contrast this with what I like to call the more classical model-based approach, maybe inspired more from uh, control theory, where we take our system and we kind of like, you know, look at it for a long time and we just try to really reason about how to build a model for, for first principles and for whatever we can't sort of get, we, we try to learn the rest from data, doing something like system identification. And then once we kind of, you know, do that scrutiny, we then take that model and then we like really try to solve this optimal control problem, right? And so we have these like two kind of very competing lines of thought and a very natural question to ask is like, well, since they're both trying to solve the same problem, which one is more efficient? And what do I mean by efficient, right? Efficiency can sort of go along a lot of different axis, axes, uh, but since we're at Colt, we'll, we'll talk, focus on sample efficiency. And uh, so it's actually quite well documented in the literature that a lot of these model-free methods are somewhat sample inefficient. Uh, so the two examples I gave you earlier, the hand example had to collect, say, 6,000 CPUs and 8 GPUs to do a lot of simulation. Uh, so maybe at industry scale, this is actually not a lot, but maybe for academics, uh, you can appreciate the scale of this. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, uh, Google um, Brain's uh, kind of robotic arm project had to actually do not simulation, but uh, real-world manipulation to collect, say, a million grasps, and that took over four months of like continuous time. So these are kind of non-trivial endeavors, and we're going to spend a lot of time on these algorithms. It really, you know, makes sense to ask the question: like, is this really fundamental? Do we really need to dedicate all these resources, or are there sort of just better algorithms that we could be using, and we should kind of devote our efforts to that? Okay, and so. Uh, there's a lot of ways we could sort of study this problem uh, theoretically. Uh, we can kind of start at uh, the, the level of kind of our tabular or finite MDPs. And I would argue that like that we've actually made, uh, not, not I, but like this field has made a lot of progress on this in, in the past uh, years or a few years. And in fact, we just saw a talk uh, about this um, from uh, Wen Sun. And so I think this is actually kind of a well understood in tabular science for the trade-offs between model-based and model-free method. So what's the end of the next step we might take? Well, we might want to try to go to a setting, a uh, more general setting where we just look at uh, MDPs with, say, some function approximation. Uh, uh, I would say that maybe this is too big of a leap because I think uh, there's still a lot of open questions about like very sharp upper bounds uh, in this more general function approximation case. And so in this talk, I'm going to kind of look at an intermediate point uh, between like tabular and function approximation, uh, where, which, is what, which is a linear quadratic regulator. And so we're going to look at model-based versus model-free methods for LQR. And here's my one slide on what LQR is to get everyone up to on, on the same page. So it's just an MDP. Uh, it's an MDP where the state space and action space are actually now going to be continuous vectors, uh, not, not um, discrete sets. Uh, but the, the, the regularity structure we impose on it is that the dynamics are going to evolve according to this linear update rule. So the linear uh, update rule is going to be parameterized by these two matrices, A and B. Uh, and, and, and so that's going to be our dynamics. And for the cost, where we, to make things easy, we actually end up also putting a quadratic cost. Depending on if we use a finite horizon formulation or an infinite horizon formulation, these look a little bit different, but they're basically the same. We have these two quadratic, uh, these two matrices, uh, Q and R, that parameterize our quadratic cost. Okay, and so for LQR, uh, kind of the two main important results that, uh, that sort of we, we, we want to build on are that if you know the dynamics A and B, then there is no question about how to solve this problem. You know exactly how to solve this problem uh, using the Bellman equations or dynamic programming, and the solution that comes out when you, when you do this dynamic programming is you actually get a linear feedback. So if it's a finite horizon problem, it's gonna be a linear time varying feedback. If it's an infinite horizon problem, you get this kind of static uh, time invariant feedback. And so this is one of the major motivations for actually studying OQR is because, well, when we sort of have the dynamics, much like the tabular setting, we know exactly how to optimize. And so we can really get, a, get at like, what happens when we don't know the dynamics. Okay, cool. So 
I'm going to uh, preview the result first with an experiment, and then we'll, we'll do a, a more rigorous version of it. But uh, I, I, I like to experiment quite a bit. Uh, so what, what we have here is a simple three-dimensional LQR problem. And what I'm going to do is basically I'm going to plot a, a lot of uh, model free algorithm and uh, uh, sorry, a lot of model classical model free algorithms and a very simple model based algorithm. And on the x axis, we're going to give these algorithms more data. And on the y axis, we're going to basically show the error. So, sort of lower down and to the right as fast as possible is where you want to be. And if we look at the blue line here, this is a very simple model based method I'll describe it on the next slide. And it's basically like has a quite a bit of a gap between a lot of classical model free methods such as policy gradients, uh, policy iteration, or kind of a random search or derivative free optimization. And so the, now the question we're gonna ask is like to what extent we can actually formalize this gap? Okay. So uh, let me first describe the model-based algorithms. So we can, uh, so if we want to, you know, formalize this gap, we want to sort of make the algorithms a little bit more formal. And so it's going to be a very simple two-step procedure where we first kind of estimate the dynamics from rollout data. So we collect trajectories, and then we can fit the transition model using something like least squares. Uh, and then once we do that, we can then take the estimates, and then we can solve using dynamic programming for the optimal policy of this estimated model. Now this is in controls known as the certainty equivalence principle. You might object and say that, like, well, this has possibly some issues of not being very robust when we have a like, kind of finite amount of data. But since we're going to be doing asymptotic analysis, we're going to kind of ignore these robustness issues and just kind of roll with certainty equivalence for now. Okay. On the flip side, I'm going to focus specifically on this policy gradient method, even though I showed uh, quite a bit of other different model-free algorithms. Uh, and uh, so just to make sure we're all on the same page for what exactly I'm going to mean by policy gradients, instead of sort of building a model and then trying to solve the optimal policy of this estimated model, what we're going to do instead is try to directly search in the space of the controller parameters and try to just kind of optimize this uh, a control objective. Okay? And the way we sort of estimate the gradients of this function is we use this very uh, it's a standard trick where we kind of perturb the action by a little bit of, say, Gaussian noise. And then we can use this action perturbation to basically get a stochastic gradient. And then we can run something like SGD. So that's going to be the policy gradient algorithm. And one of the uh, results of this talk is that we, show that, uh, that we show that there exists a family of LQR systems for where the policy gradient method I, I described on the previous slide requires state dimension times horizon length more samples than the model-based method I described two slides ago in order to achieve the same level of performance. So kind of more in symbols, we prove an upper bound on the model-based risk that scales something like order nd over big N. N here is the state dimension, D is the input dimension, and big N is the number of rollouts or trajectories you collect. And on the other hand, we prove a, a lower bound for this um, uh, policy gradient method, where the risk scales like t times n squared times d over big N, where t in here now is the horizon length, and n, remember, is the state dimension, d is the input dimension, and big N is the number of rollouts that you sort of collect. And uh, so if we sort of compare this upper and lower bound, we see a gap that scales like n times t, which is the claim state dimension times horizon length. And it's worth noting that uh, this bound is actually proved uh, using, if you're familiar with kind of policy gradients, really when you run through in practice, you actually have to be very careful about what val uh, baseline you actually pick. And so this bound is actually proven using an exact value function baseline, which is actually something you cannot implement. So if you actually wanted to implement this, uh, you would actually have to basically, the risk would be worse uh, because you would actually have to estimate the value function. Okay. All right, and so now you might say, well, I showed you a bunch of other algorithms, what about them? Well, we can prove, uh, so instead of sort of just going to every single other algorithm trying to do kind of an asymptotic analysis for each one, one of these, I, I prove a lower bound that basically says that there's no other method that can be more sample efficient on this family of instances uh, than the model-based uh, method to achieve the same level of performance. And so it's one of these information theoretic lower bounds where we show that the risk of any algorithm is going to scale like nd over big N. And previously on this slide before, we showed the upper bound of the model based to be, you know, matching this thing up to constants. Okay. And so, uh, so that, that sort of wraps it up. And so well, interesting things I think the, this, this uh, work sort of uh, brings up is different questions about like how do different parameterization sort of affect policy gradient. Uh, in particular, I showed you we study policy gradient using like this, uh, where we actually just directly search over the, the controller parameters. Uh, if you're familiar in controls, there's actually different ways you can parameterize your controls. You can use, for instance, like a EULA parameterization, and that might actually affect the sample complexity of uh, policy gradients. So, like, what what sort of changes when we change parameterizations? So I think that's one interesting question. Another is sort of uh, beyond LQR is to really use this asymptotic framework to try to understand the effect of baselines and policy gradients a little bit better. And obviously, in the future, we want to move towards more general function approximation settings. OK, and so that's all I have. Unfortunately, the post already happened. But uh, if you want to see the paper, you can find links on my website. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>
Yeah, so that's, a, that's a great question. So for the particular example that we pick, uh, the natural gradient actually doesn't do very much because uh, I, I sort of made everything nice so that this Fisher information is basically like scaled identity. Uh, but uh, I think it's like, like I sort of hint here about these different parameterizations, like uh, if you sort of, you know, maybe use a smarter parameterization in your controller, I think that might actually uh, help. So that's interesting, like, to see if it's possible. Yeah, that's something we actually have tried to work on a little bit where you do basically kind of more like an MPC approach where you have kind of an S approximate of the model and approximate value function and you can imagine trying to trade them off. Uh, it's a little bit hard to get lower bounds there. So like we can sort of get upper bounds, but sort of characterizing that exactly is, uh, I think, still kind of difficult. So I don't re really know how to do that. Uh, get well, okay, so LST, so we have analyzed LSTD, right? But in those there, you don't really need to estimate any of the transition dynamics. You just kind of go exactly for the value function. And those, those all seem to work really terribly in practice. Uh, yeah. At least on the LQR instance. Yeah. All right, thank you.